I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and we're delighted to bring you a semester's worth of um, programs each Wednesday um, in this auditorium. Um, I'm sorry that this uh, this week we're, we're actually, this semester we're starting a week late. Um, there was too much snow in Philadelphia last week, and our speaker needed to travel through that airport. Uh, to get here last week. So we are rescheduling Christine Montross for next September when I trust we won't have snow or a hurricane. Um, but our program today is called Dissecting Gray's Anatomy. In 1858, young English surgeons Henry Gray and Henry Van Dyke Carter published an illustrated anatomy textbook for medical students. Gray's Anatomy, as this book has become known, has never since been out of print and is now recognized as a turning point in medical history. Indeed, this illustrated text has become so well known in popular culture that its title is riffed on in the medical television show Gray's Anatomy, in which case Gray is spelled with an E, not an A, as in the book. But across all these years since the anatomical text's publication, precious little was known about the, genera the genesis of the book, or about its author and its illustrator. Then, just a few years ago, acclaimed science writer Bill Hayes, in a project sparked by a photograph of Henry Gray, was inspired to piece together the story of Drs. Gray and Carter. And uh, in the process, he made a wonderful book called The Anatomist. In this Medical Center Hour, Mr. Hayes explores the medical, historical, and artistic significance of Gray's Anatomy. And he covers also in this book his own unforgettable year of anatomical dissection alongside medical students in an anatomy lab. We're really thrilled to have Bill Hayes with us today and so very glad that this latest snowfall last night didn't prevent his traveling to us from New York City. <laughs> Um, the UVA bookstore is uh, supposed to be here uh, up in the upper lobby afterwards with copies of The Anatomist for sale, and Bill has kindly agreed to sign books. Um, I'd like to mention this is one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures offered in partnership with Historical Collections in the Claude Moore uh, Health Sciences Library. Um, also, um, the CME office would like me to tell you that Bill Hayes has identified no financial conflicts of interest. Uh, in his talk. So I will now turn you over to Bill Hayes and what I can promise you will be um, a fascinating and delightful hour with us. <laughs> Thank you, you Marsha. Thank you also to Joan Klein, uh, who's been great in organizing this visit. It's really a delight to be here and uh, Doubly so, because over the past year, the Virginia Quarterly Review, the wonderful literary magazine published at the University of Virginia, has published a series of my shorter personal essays. So uh, it's really nice to be here where the VQR makes its home. I'm here today to share with you stories about The Anatomist. Um, the Anatomist is my third book. Um, and as in the earlier two books, my memoir about insomnia called Sleep Demons and my history of human blood called Five Ports. In The Anatomist, I weave together a scientific narrative, medical history, and a personal narrative. And in this case, I'm telling the story behind the classic book, Grave Anatomy. I weave into it a chronicle of the year that I spent studying anatomy alongside med students. And I'm often asked how I got the idea for this book and how I came up with the idea to structure it in this way. And the truth is that it started, as all of my books have, with a very simple, almost stupid question. I'd, um, I'd had a copy of Gray's Anatomy for many years. I think I bought my first copy back in the early 1980s, probably at a used bookstore, and mostly it just collected dust on my shelf. But every now and then, I would use the book to check a fact. And it was actually while I was fact-checking my second book, Five Quarts, 
the book was in galleys, and I wanted to just make sure I had something right about the arterial system. And I pulled out my trusty Gray's Anatomy and checked it and put it back on the shelf. And I still remember to this day, I'm just about to put it on the shelf, and I pulled it back out. And I looked at the cover. This is the actual cover. And I just thought, who wrote this thing? My first impulse was really just to check the book itself. So I looked on the jacket flap. There was nothing about the author except his full name, Henry Gray. There was no um, about the author page in the back of the book. So I looked at some reference sources I have at home, an encyclopedia. Still really didn't find anything. So my next step was just to go to the uh, online library catalog. Because I thought, well, certainly there's got to be a biography of Henry Gray. I was just curious. And uh, there wasn't. So I reached my first dead end. And um, rather than be discouraged, the kind of light switch went on. And I thought, maybe I'll write a biography of Henry Gray. Um, I began doing a little bit of research. And what I could find was this. The actual date of his birth is not known. But um, it's thought to be 1827. Um, his father was a private messenger to King George IV. At uh, age 18, he entered St. George's Hospital as a uh, medical student. He, uh, no surprise, excelled at anatomy. He became an anatomist and a surgeon and a postmortem examiner. And uh, at a very young age, a relatively young age, a fellow of the Royal Society. And of course, he was an author. Henry Gray was 31 years old when Gray's Anatomy was published in 1858. I learned that he never married. And after his father's death, he lived alone with his mother uh, in the family home. And that um, he died just three years after Gray's Anatomy was published. So he died in 1861. At that point, he had completed revisions for the second edition of the book, and in fact, had written a completely new book, a whole other manuscript. But this other manuscript has never been found. And uh, no papers, no diaries, no manuscripts, no ephemera seem to have survived. And then, I found one last thing. Nothing really had survived, and yet I did find this one photo. It kind of looks like an art studio, right? A nice skylight and drawings on the walls. Young man in smocks. There's even one young man in a beret towards the front. And Henry Gray. He's the one next to the dead body. This is a class photo, Henry Gray and his students in the anatomy lab, taken about 15 months before his death. Henry Gray's the one with the arrow going into his head. <laughs> to my eyes, he kind of looked like a young Heathcliff. He just had this very intense look in his eyes, and uh, a short little man. And something about this photograph and the look in his face was captivating to me. I likened it almost to a feeling like um, love at first sight. I just knew I had to know more about this man. And uh, really, the, uh, the book was really born at that moment. But I felt that if I were going to write a biography of Henry Gray, that I should know something more about anatomy. I have no formal background in medicine or science myself. And so I literally pulled out the phone book and looked up the number for UCSF. I was living in San Francisco at the time and uh, found the general information number for the university. Uh, they transferred me to the anatomy department. And uh, the uh, receptionist then transferred me to a professor. And I made my pitch. <laughs> I very excitedly told her that uh, I had this idea to write a biography of Henry Gray. And I wanted to learn something about anatomy. And could I possibly sit in on an anatomy class? 
And uh, she said, well, in fact, we have a, a course starting in about two weeks, and you're welcome to come to the first class. So I said, great. In the time leading up to that class, I learned something very surprising, or very surprising to me. And that was that Henry Gray himself did not do any of the drawings for which the book is so famous, the draw some of which you have seen already. That these were the work of another Henry, someone named Henry Van Dyke Carter. He was not credited in the copy of the book I had, and, and in fact was not credited in any copies of Gray's Anatomy, I think after the second edition. So I began doing some digging into the life of Henry Carter, and I learned that Carter was four years younger than Gray, and in fact they had met at a, uh, within a classroom at St. George's, where Henry Gray was his anatomy teacher. Henry Carter's father was a very successful painter, um, not a Matisse, but a, a successful commercial landscape painter. And in fact, uh, Henry Carter, the son, was naturally gifted. But he never, never seriously pursued art as a career. He followed a path uh, somewhat like Henry Gray's, <clears throat> becoming an anatomist, and a surgeon, and a teacher, um, he did also become an apothecary, a licensed apothecary, which at the time was almost like a combination of a, a GP and a, a pharmacist. But one thing made Henry Carter completely unlike Gray to me, and that was that he had left behind numerous papers, diaries, letters, photographs, all dating back to age 14. Now, apparently, they had been um, handed down within his family, and then one of the great grandnieces had donated the material to the Wellcome Medical Library in London. So I was able to find that the material had all been processed and archived, and uh, was at the Wellcome Library, but hadn't really been studied. So I thought, well, I could make a trip to London, but I don't know that I can afford that, and I talked the archivist into uh, making a microfilm of one of the diaries. Um, this was really in the days, not that long ago, but in the days before it was common to scan things. So she, uh, she said she would make a microfilm, and then I bought a copy um, for her to send to me. So I had to wait a few weeks for this to arrive, and in that time, I couldn't help but think, is there going to be anything worthwhile in the diary? Will I be able to read it? Is it going to be worth it? And six weeks later, my answer arrived on a fat plastic spool in a thick cardboard box. And I dashed down to that last bastion of microfilm projectors in the public library. <laughs> and uh, I can still picture to this day, you know, getting in front of the projector, plopping the spool into the machine, and threading it through and pressing start, and just letting it fly through, and then just kind of randomly pressing stop on a random page. So as you can imagine, my first question, can I read anything? <laughs> so I'll let you look and think about that for a moment. Uh, there's just jottings and almost scribbled handwriting. And for a moment, I felt a sense of panic, like, oh my god, doctor's handwriting. <laughs> um, but then I found one word, gray. Gray, 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 on this page that I had stopped on. And I realized at that moment that gray was in these pages, Henry Gray, and that his life was probably written about in these pages, and that perhaps I could find a story here. So I went back to page one, and literally began the process of deciphering and transcribing this diary of Henry Carter's um, all the way through. And I would go to the public library every day for days and days and days, trying to make sense of this handwriting and see what I could learn. <clears throat> 
So the question becomes, what did I gain and glean from these diaries written hundreds of years ago? Definitely insights into Carter's personality, um, his character, his ambitions, his private struggles with religion, with his father, with his medical career, with his artistic aspirations, um, with romance. So all the kinds of things that a diarist confides to a diary. Carter was definitely a kind of tortured soul, um, sort of agonized over every decision. And uh, in this, I felt like I'd almost found a kindred spirit, because that's a little bit the way I am as well. So I found myself really identifying with Carter. Um, aside from writing about himself and his family and his own struggles, um, there are details about his mother. His mother had breast cancer and died. Um, his father, who was a constant source of struggle. Um, details about Victorian medicine and even about Queen Victoria herself, who he glimpses one day. Um, and of course, Henry Gray. Henry Gray comes up often in Carter's diaries and his letters home, and clearly Carter admired the man. He, um, he often described himself as the antithesis of Henry Gray. So Gray was even-tempered, driven, hardworking, disciplined, um, he possessed all the character traits and qualities and talents that Carter did not. So he always saw himself really in relation to the man, the slightly older man. Except for in one way, and that was in his artistic talent. It was clear that Gray had no artistic talent whatsoever. And I learned that he had commissioned Carter to do illustrations several years before Gray's Anatomy was even conceived. Here you can see a little um, ad that Carter took out in The Lancet advertising his services as a freelance artist just to make some extra money um, while he was in school. I learned that they began working together several years before, uh, several years before Grace Anatomy was conceived and while Carter was still a student. Uh, he illustrated some of Gray's early papers Henry Gray had a book before Gray's Anatomy on the spleen, which Carter also illustrated. And uh, all of this kind of provided an interesting, almost dramatic backdrop for the day in November 1855, when Henry Gray proposed to Carter that they produce a manual on anatomy. Now I say um, dramatic, um, in fact, Maybe dramatic just to me, but Gray, um, Gray proposed it in a very kind of casual way to Carter. And Carter recorded this in his diary almost as if it was no big deal. So this is a quote from November 25th, 1855. Henry Carter writes, little to record. Gray made proposal to assist him by drawing and in bringing out a manual for anatomy for students. A good idea. Did not come to any plan. Now, it took several weeks for them to work out the details, and it wasn't until about a month later that Carter wrote again in his diary, and he wrote, renewed conversation with Gray as to the proposed manual of anatomy which I am to illustrate, may end in something. <laughs> Gray is shrewd but considerate. The proposal seems providential. You'll note that he said shrewd. Uh, in fact, Carter was paid a flat fee of 150 pounds, as was Gray. But Gray also negotiated with the publisher for an additional 150 pounds for every thousand copies of the book sold, which ultimately benefited several generations of Gray's heirs over the years. 
The publisher wanted to ascribe joint authorship to both Gray and Carter, but Gray objected. Um, he wanted full credit himself, and that's the way it went. The original title for the book was simply Anatomy, Descriptive and Surgical, and it wasn't until many years later that it became known as Gray's Anatomy. So, the two Henrys signed contracts and commenced to work. Henry Gray was 28 years old and Carter was 25. The two performed dissections together and they worked collaboratively on the book. What's kind of amazing to me is that they finished it in 18 months, which is pretty remarkable when you consider First of all, they were both working full time as surgeons and teachers. And um, Gray wrote more than 700 pages of text. And Carter completed almost 400 drawings. And uh, they did this in just 18 months. Which, uh, if nothing else, puts me to shame. It takes me a couple of years at least to write a book. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? So I want to step back for just a moment and give you a little bit of historical context. As many of you know, Gray's Anatomy was not the first anatomy book. A man called Mandino Dolucci, an Italian, receives credit for that. This is a page from Dolucci's book. Human dissection had been largely forbidden in antiquity in ancient Greece and Rome. So Hippocrates, the father of medicine, and Galen, his great successor, never uh, performed human dissection. They did, there was some dissection done by Galen quite a bit on animals, but not on humans. And it wasn't until the year 1240 that Frederick the Great, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, decreed that one body could be dissected every five years. This was a great advance. And by the early 14th century, when Mondino de Lucci did his book, this had been up to one body every year. Mondino de Lucci is kind of an obscure figure, but I'm sure all of you know who Andreas Vesalius is the Belgian anatomist who was at the University of Padua and created his masterpiece titled in English, The Fabric of the Body, which was published in 1544. This is really a book that marks a kind of turning point in medical history because in the book, Vesalius essentially dismantled the air-field doctrine of Galenism, which was based so much on animal dissection rather than human dissection. So now if you fast forward about 300 years, come to the time of Gray's Anatomy, and I guess around the time this university was founded as well, two important events set the stage for the success of Gray's Anatomy. One of them was the, what was called the Anatomy Act of 1832. And this was an act in England that made it legal and possible to dissect cadavers. Before that time, there was a whole uh, surge of grave robbers who literally dug up graves, um, stole cadavers, and sold them. The Anatomy Act of 1832 made it possible to, to legally dissect cadavers for examination. The other thing really important to remember is that this was at the dawn of modern surgery. Um, anesthesia in its earliest forms had just been developed a few years before Gray and Carter began work on their book. Chloroform was, I believe, the, the first real form of anesthesia used. And in fact, Queen Victoria herself was one of the first to agree or be allowed to be put under when she gave birth to her son Leopold. Prince Leopold, and in a way, therefore, making it seem safe to be put under with chloroform. 
So with surgery really at the dawn of the modern age, there was a need for a new anatomy textbook, one that would go literally deeper into the human body. And, um, and this is when Gray and Carter come up with their idea for the book. There were definitely other anatomy books at the time, both before and after Gray's Anatomy was published. Um, one very popular one was called Quain's Anatomy. Um, but Gray's Anatomy is the one that succeeded. And even it, in its first edition, sold out. Now, the question is why? And I think partly for purely practical reasons, Gray and Carter had just been students themselves. They were teachers themselves. And so they made some very kind of small changes in an anatomy textbook that made a big difference to students. So for instance, you'll notice that they put the anatomical names on the parts themselves, which makes them easier to remember. I looked at other anatomy texts from that time, and often the illustration would be on one page, and then the, uh, the list of the parts or the descriptions would be on another and sometimes maybe even in the back of the book. So you have to flip back and forth. And just this really very simple innovation of putting the names on the parts made Gray's a more popular textbook. But there were other little reasons as well. Literally little. Um, it was a small book. It was only about six by nine inches. So it was portable and lightweight, whereas other books of the time were multi-volume books on anatomy and heavier. So it was just easier to take around. It was also priced right. It was 28 shillings, which is about one and a half pounds. But I think, you know, to my mind, these are not the reasons that Gray's Anatomy has survived to this day. It's really the longevity of the book, I think, can be contributed to Carter's illustrations. They're accurate, as you'll see, without being clinical. They're elegant and sensitively drawn, but they remain objective. I don't, you know, Carter's father was an artist. He did have some artistic aspirations himself, but I don't think he had any real aspirations for these as works of art. They were meant to be illustrations, first of all. And, and not as fine art. I think another thing that makes the Carter work um, so memorable is that unlike Vesalius, this is another slide from the Vesalius book, he didn't place the bodies, oops, he didn't place the bodies in sort of classical bucolic settings, which make that work seem kind of dated. But instead, They're just on their own. It's the part itself. It has a kind of elegance to it, yet it's clear and accurate. And it gives the work a kind of timelessness, which explains, in a certain way, why Great's Anatomy is still published and bought today. And I've learned it's as popular with artists of every type as it is with medical students and doctors. Gray and Carter finished the book in July 1857, and it was published about a year later. But by that point, Carter was not even living in England. He was, um, as I said, kind of a tortured soul, constantly searching. And uh, he up and left and moved to Bombay. Uh, he joined the military. And uh, Henry Carter was many things, um, but soldier wasn't really among them. <laughs> and I know this from the diaries. So it wasn't long on the front lines before he was transferred to another setting, a little more conducive to his temperament, a medical college in Bombay called Grant Medical College. And uh, he was a surgeon here and taught anatomy. And I'll let you guess what textbook he used in his anatomy classes in Bombay. <laughs> I was able at the British Library to dig up the syllabuses used in Bombay and found that the textbook he used was Gray's Anatomy. 
Carter stayed in Bombay um, almost 30 years before finally returning to England, um, at which point he married for the first time, had children, and eventually retired. He died at age 65 in 1897. As for Henry Gray, Gray had died 36 years earlier, as I said. He died of smallpox. He had actually been vaccinated against the disease, but he was treating a nephew who was 10 years old, and the nephew survived, but Henry Gray died within one week. Very, very fast. He died at home. And herein, I theorized lies the answer to the mystery of what could have happened to Henry Gray's papers, why nothing survived. So think about it. At that time in Victorian England, the way to deal with contagious disease was to burn all the possessions of the victim. So into an incinerator went bedding, clothing, rugs, Wallpaper was taken off of walls, and I am theorizing the papers that were literally on his desk and in his desk, um, the papers of Henry Gray. But of course the book itself survives. Uh, it's in its 39th edition today. Um, it's never gone out of print, as Marsha said, and uh, it's was the inspiration for my book, The Anatomist, and is still an inspiration for anatomist doctors and artists today. I told you a little bit about the two main anatomists in my book, Henry Gray and Henry Carter, but um, there is a third anatomist in the book, an amateur anatomist, and that would mean be me. Um, after I made that call to UCSF, I, uh, I did go to the first class. It was in a hall <coughs> like this, except even larger, I think. And uh, it was an 8 a.m. class. I remember I sat in the front row. Everything went completely over my head. But I was really fascinated. And uh, I came back the next day, and the next day. And on the day when <coughs> we were going to the lab for the first time, I asked if I could tag along, and they said, sure. So I did. <laughs> and essentially, I just kept coming back. And um, eventually, I started keeping a diary of my own about my experiences, and uh, began to weave that story into the Chronicle of Gray and Carter. And uh, I took three, or audited three complete courses on anatomy, and then a shorter course on the anatomy of the brain. So um, I'm going to finish by giving you a little sense of what it was like for me on the first day in the anatomy lab. And I'm going to read you a little portion from the book. Those of you here who have done anatomy <clears throat> may be able to identify with this. And those who haven't, can experience it vicariously. <laughs> this is a piece um, adapted from the book called The Anatomy Lesson. On the first day in the lab, I'm mistaken for a teaching assistant six times, which on the one hand simply tells me I'm old, a good 20 years older than the average student, but on the other hand, it seems to imply that I belong. Choosing the glass half full, I smile through each mistaken identity. The class size is 120, 150 if you count the cadavers. We have been warned beforehand that some students are kind of overwhelmed by the first sight of the dead bodies, and sure enough, some students clearly are. But I find myself more freaked out by that woman in the gas mask. What does she know that the rest of us don't? From the far end of the lab comes a kind of disembodied voice, tinnily amplified. 
class. Hello, comes this voice. It's Sexton Sutherland, one of the three professors for this 10-week course on gross anatomy. Before we get started, he says, some housekeeping rules. No eating your lunch in here. No music. Please don't take any pictures. And try to keep your voices down. Laughter's OK, Dr. Sutherland says. It's a great way to release emotion, but not at the expense of the wonderful people who donated their bodies to our program. OK, he says, let's get going. So six of us arrange ourselves around cadaver number four. But rather than looking at the naked female body lying before us, we all just stare at one another. I haven't dissected anything since high school biology, one of the three women says, breaking the ice. And that was a fraud. This seems like the right moment to make an admission of my own. So I tell them, I'm not a student here. I'm doing research for a book, and I'm just going to be an observer. All but one of them look as though they would pay to trade places with me. <laughs> the one exception, Gurgen, a tall, husky, hairy guy who says he's never dissected anything in his life, agrees to take it on and volunteer to begin the dissection. Our cadaver was partially dissected during a previous course, so the first task is simply to unpack the body. Gurgen folds back the two panels of skin in size to top the chest then grasps the edges of the underlying breastplate. He lifts, and a powerful wave of fumes escapes from the cadaver, making all of us flinch. Gurgen now appears on the verge of losing his lunch, so Amy, one of the others, agrees to take over. I read aloud from the lab guide as she picks up the scalpel and makes a large, neat, cross-shaped cut atop the pericardium, the opaque protective sac that encloses the heart. She peels back each flap, exposing the heart, then reaches for a larger blade. Amy slices through the blood vessels, entering and exiting the heart, puts down the knife, grasps the heart with both hands, and tugs uprooting the organ from its bedding in the chest. Switching to a finer blade, she makes a small doorway into the right atrium and a larger opening in the left ventricle. Now, one of the other instructors, her name was Dana, has been observing how we're doing, and she suggests that someone take the heart to the sink and rinse it out. I volunteer. <coughs> With an air of quiet ceremony, Amy places the heart into my gloved hands, and I instinctively draw it to my chest. My own heart instantly speeds up. The lab suddenly seems terribly crowded, the distance to the big stainless steel sink vast. I feel as if I'm carrying the most fragile thing in the world, which is actually kind of silly, because our heart is already broken, in a sense. Our cadaver had died of heart failure. But once I begin rinsing the heart, praying it with one hand while rubbing it with the other, I start to relax. It's tough and rubbery. The aorta, the major artery emerging from the heart, is like a severed garden hose. And the smaller blood vessels are almost like the roots of a turnip. What washes down the drain is a grainy brown paste coagulated blood. So I pat the heart dry and return to our table. You really can't hold a human heart without questioning how it ever became known as the center of emotion, or the chief mansion of the soul, as it's been called, the organ of the vital faculty, the fountain of the vital spirits. To me, the heart doesn't look or feel like anything but what it is, a tough, muscular pump. <laughs>
But wait, not so fast. Dr. Rowe has been standing by and she says, let me show you something. So we crowd around her as she lifts up our heart and pulls the doorway into the right atrium as far back as it will go. Now, she says, unfortunately you can't actually see it, but right inside here, where the superior vena cava enters the right atrium, she's pointing to a little spot atop the fold, right at that ridge is a little area where a cluster of cells is embedded. It's called the sinoatrial or SA node, but it's known as the pacemaker. In other words, this is where your heart's speed is set. While Dr. Rode explains how the SA node works, electrical signals generating these cells spread to other cells across the heart, causing it to contract to beat. I find myself dazzled by this perfect meeting of anatomy and metaphor. In the human body, the node is positioned right under the sternum, dead center in the chest. So in a sense, this truly is where feelings such as terror, love, and elation are first felt, where your heart starts to race, pound, flutter. Looking up, I notice that Amy is doing exactly what I'm doing. We both stand with a hand at the center of our chest, instinctively feeling the moment. Here, right here, is where wonder begins. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we have a pretty generous amount of time in which to uh, have some exchange with Bill Hayes and you know, somewhere along the way, we may be able to entice him to read us a little bit more <laughs> from the book as well, because you do read beautifully as you write. Um, so who would like to start the conversation? And please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, Gene Corbett, uh, I'm on the faculty of medicine. <clears throat> Thank you, that was very fascinating. I am struck by the fact that there were only three years of age difference between Henry Gray and Henry Carter. Mm -hmm. Did you pick up any explanation on <clears throat> how the book Authors didn't get placed in both of their names. You asked why? Um, yeah, why did it turn out the way it did? Why didn't uh, Henry Carter have his name on there? Well, there are a couple reasons. First of all, um, that's the way Gray wanted it. Uh, <laughs> he was not only the author, but the initiator of the project. He was the one who essentially came up with the idea, proposed it, and went to the publisher. Um, you know, I think matters were a little bit different then. You know. Vesalius' as illustrator is also not well known. Um, essentially, Carter saw himself as being hired to illustrate the book. Um, I don't know that he would have even insisted on um, having joint authorship. It is true that his name was in the first edition of the book and the second, but then it disappears. You know, I think it has partly to do with Carter himself. He had, by that point, moved to Bombay, had nothing to do with um, other editions of the book, and um, as new editions came out, they hired new illustrators to add to the book. Um, but yeah, he, he kind of gets lost, and in the copy of Gray's Anatomy I had, there was no mention of Carter. I'm Bob Chevalier from the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, one thing about the dates of uh, the story you're telling that strike me are that uh, 1858 was the year before Darwin published The Origin of Species. And you were talking about the uh, a lot of the literature in the past had been based on animal dissections. Were there, was there anything in, in Carter's uh, diary or the other materials you looked at that indicated any, any thoughts that these folks had or the people around them in terms of comparing the structures they were studying with animals and the relationship of man to animals? You know, I think there was some comparative anatomy. I kind of quickly skipped over um, one of Carter's sketches of uh, it's the anatomy of an anteater. Um, so he was also doing uh, some uh, 
anatomy of animals, and there was some comparative anatomy. But you know, my sources were mostly his diaries and letters, and it's not necessarily the thing he wrote about. It's an interesting problem to have in a certain way um, with a diarist, because the diarist is essentially writing to himself, so he doesn't have to explain things that he already knows. And uh, he had his own shorthand, his own abbreviations for things that I had to sometimes figure out. And there are plenty of things I just couldn't figure out. Um, but no, and, and Darwin doesn't come up in the writings either. Mm -hmm. Sounds like good cell biology. In the evolution of the teaching of, of physicians, there's a lot of change going on. Yeah. And that change, in some sense, threatens both the viability and use of textbooks and even the, the usefulness of uh, cadaver dissection. And uh, it evolved through multimedia and things like that, and all yeah. kinds of ways of giving information to medical students, even assuming that they can learn everything they need to learn about the body from alternative media, what do you lose as an individual if, if we give up good average section as a part of medical education? <clears throat> good question. Uh, when I was doing my studying, and I was at UCSF, I don't know if I made that clear, I was living in San Francisco, and uh, the anatomy lab at UCSF, just by the way, is has the most incredible view of San Francisco. It happens that it's on the top floor of the building, and you can see the Golden Gate Bridge. It's really spectacular. Um, towards the end of my year there, they really began to introduce more multimedia, um, uh, DVROMs, and trying those kinds of things. And they even had um, a computer or a monitor in the lab itself. But it was clear that students weren't interacting with them and learning from them in the same way they did with when they dissected. Uh, we also had prosections, which were um, previously dissected, prepared parts of the body that students studied from. Um, I personally feel like there's really no substitute for doing the human dissection. Um, not only for what you learn and how you memorize, you know, there's nothing like actually feeling it tactily and in doing it to help you remember the parts. But there is definitely a kind of rite of passage that happens with those students that I witnessed, um, well, that I witnessed three times um, with each course um, that seems to me important at the, at the start of a medical career. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, Karen Knight from the Medical Library. I was wondering if um, the diary gave any um, inside is that their method of working together. Mm -hmm. So did Gray, for instance, dissect on his own and then left samples for him to draw? Actually, what I learned, and it kind of surprised me, especially going back to your question, they definitely worked together collaboratively. And um, they dissected together. So they would go at night to the lab, dissect together, and make decisions together about what should be illustrated, what should be included in the book, um, the order of things. Um, so there was definitely a collaboration. At the same time, and I think I kind of hinted at that, um, I did not get the impression that they were close friends. Um, I don't think they did things socially. Um, it was definitely a professional relationship in which Gray was the older, um, more powerful figure. Here we go, surgery. Um, in administration, I don't do any of the surgeries. Um, question, um, with Carter, was he, you said his, his father was a was an artist. Uh, right. Was he uh, professionally trained in any of this type of, of drawings? And then a uh, second part of the question was, thinking about the process of this, of, of the amount of time that they would have to spend with the cadavers to draw in this kind of detail. Does he speak to that any in the journals about the impact of that? Or, I mean, just the intimate nature that he would really have to be so vested in both sides to make it come out the way that it did. Yeah. Did you mean did it was his father trained or Carter? Was Carter professionally trained? No, he wasn't. Uh, he was just naturally gifted. Um, but 
never went to school, uh, was never trained in the arts. Uh, his father, as I said, was a painter, so was, you know, in the family. Um, he doesn't dwell at length about the kind of um, intimate meeting with death that, that one comes to in the anatomy lab. Um, I think it was very much part of the profession for him. Um, but, you know, I think one can get a lot, learn a lot about Carter from the drawings. There's certainly sensitivity and a sense of elegance um, and objectivity. It's kind of remarkable, really, that he did not, um, he really didn't pursue art after this book. As I said, he moved to Bombay. Um, at first, he was on the front lines as a soldier. That did not work out. And then he went to teach. And he really didn't illustrate again significantly for the rest of his life. He did do research in Bombay. Carter did some um, research on leprosy and um, diseases indigenous to that area. Preston Reynolds, uh, Center for Biomedical Research Humanity. I am both a physician and a historian, and um, people in the community of medical historians um, struggle with to what degree they need to work with something medicine to get the story right. And you may have addressed this because I came in uh, a little later, but what was, to what degree did the people that you worked with in the anatomy lab at UCSF help you construct a story in a way that you felt was true to anatomy, rather than just the biography of these two individuals. And my other question is, has this made you interested in doing more in medical history? <laughs> I, I felt so privileged to be part of those classes, really, truly. Um, and one of the greatest things about the experience was the teachers sort of treated me just like another student. So um, I was serious about it. They took me seriously. They were um, could be tough taskmasters. I did the homework as well. I took the first final exam, and I'll admit that I did pass, but I <laughs> just barely passed. Um, I think I was second to the last in the whole class. But um, they didn't really help me in any way with the book itself. Um, they advised, they answered questions when I had them, and when the book was in galleys, read it and make sure I had everything right. <laughs> uh, you know, all of my books have dealt in one way or the other with medical history and the body. Um, I'm now working on two new books. One of them is a um, history of exercise, which is called Sweat. And um, this will be dealing, it'll be like the other books, a kind of personal narrative and um, kind of journey of discovery and um, a look at the history of exercise and the science of exercise. So my fascination with the body just continues. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about Mary Faith Marshall, Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. I'm curious about the mechanics of your search in terms of the journal. You started with a word, right. the first word that you, that you could read, and, and you said that you know, there were parts of it that you could never interpret, never get to. But so, how long did it take you to, you know, sort of get a working sense of being able to interpret what he had, and, and did that influence you in any way in your own journal writing? Although I know your journal writing had to do with the anatomy lab, and it wasn't necessarily about that, but did it inform your thinking in any way? I would say it took me several weeks working with the first microfilm uh, before I really began to feel like this is going to work. Um, but then it took months. It, it took months of going through it and allowing for the fact that I wouldn't be able to figure it all out, you know, leaving parts. And then, you know, things began to become a little clearer. And I'd figure out that, oh, this is a simple one, but you know, F meant his father. So I could go back and figure out, oh, he's writing about his father here, F. Um, so it just, it's like with any kind of handwriting, I guess, the more I sat with it and worked with it, the better I got to know it. 
I um, studied that first microfilm, then I went over to London, and um, I think I went three times, and would spend days at the Welcome Medical Library, and uh, with the terrific staff there, and it was a very different experience to go through the material firsthand, and be able to handle the letters and the diaries, and, um, and I got another microfilm made of another diary so I could take it back. It took, you know, it was at the same time that I was taking the anatomy class, so it was a year of partly in an anatomy lab, partly in a public library, which was sort of the story of my life, I guess. Um, like Carter, I have kept journals since I was 14, probably. I don't know that it had an impact on how I wrote, but um, I did keep a separate diary just about the anatomy classes. And every day I would come home and just write about it. And it was, it was just such an amazing experience um, to be able to be part of that. <coughs> but I should say, it wasn't my idea at the outset to interweave the two. It was like maybe a couple months into the anatomy classes, I suddenly thought, this could be very cool to weave them together. Bill, my name's John Hare. I, I taught anatomy for... Oh. I taught anatomy here for 30 years. And Graves has always been a, you know, a text with high concentration of regional information, a lot of depth. Hey, did you get access to edition one, edition two, and looked at how it was edited over time? Or, or is the quality of its current uh, information reflective of what that first edition was like? Um, <clears throat> there's probably not a word from the first edition that's in the current edition. It's changed that much, which is probably as it should be, really. I'm maybe one of the few people who's read the whole thing of the original a couple of times. Um, it's not the most fascinating reading. Um, <laughs> um, but it did change even from the first edition to the second to the third. So I would go to the library and lay out all three editions and then, you know, page through it. And um, in the first edition, there's a little bit more of Gray's, a little bit more of Gray's personality in the book, where he's just a little bit commenting on things and maybe introducing a section. And then as it goes on, those get cut out and it's just sort of straight information. So in the first edition, and I guess in the second as well, you feel a little bit like you feel a little more like you're in the hands of the anatomist himself. Um, I should also say that in the course I took at UCSF, we did not use Gray's Anatomy. Um, we used a text that the professor herself had created, and we used Nutters. Is that it right, Nutters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is fabulous as well. This is a perfect segue to let, me, let you know that I think it's the 25th of March, um, we're going to have a talk sponsored by the School of Nursing and several other units uh, here at UVA. Um, a talk by Frank Netter's daughter. Really? Um, and the library will have um, an exhibit of some of Netter's drawings which reside uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I think uh, Novartis Pharmaceuticals owns a lot of the drawings as well. Um, Francine Netter has written um, a biography of her father's um, life and art, and so she'll be talking a bit about that. So we'll announce that um, closer to the time. But um, yeah, I was thinking of this pantheon of anatomists and illustrators um, as you were talking, and also just the interesting sort of um, journey that you've had decoding the person from the diaries and then seeing how they decoded the body in, in the drawings and the textbook. Um, so thank you so much. We um, invite you to come back next week.